Okay, we're going to switch over to uh, this. And okay, I think we're on. Sorry, for some reason it was set to um, NVIDIA Broadcast. And NVIDIA Broadcast, the microphone is um, not set up. Well, technically it is set up, but it was wired, wired into, into something, something else. else. Yes, yes, we have, we have sound. sound. I, I do apologize, apologize for that. For that. So, so the, the issue was that, that uh, NVIDIA, NVIDIA for some, some reason got tapped, tapped to my Oculus, Oculus Quest microphone. microphone. Uh, my, uh, my Oculus Quest is broken, broken so, so it's kind of useless, useless to do that. that. All, right, All right, so we, so we have sound. sound. I'm going to finish, finish off making, making these posts, posts and, uh, and then we'll be good to go. I hope everyone is enthused and ready to rumble. And... And we'll, and get, we'll going. get going. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, so like, yeah I like I said, I can't, I can't seem, seem to see me on Facebook. Facebook. So, so even, even though, though it says, it says I'm running a 60 frames per second on Facebook, I don't think, think I'm actually streaming. streaming. Um, um, if, if, if that's, that's, the, if that's, that's the, case, the case, I'd be really, really surprised. surprised. And uh, because, uh, because no matter what, what I do, I can never, never ever, ever get this thing working. working. Um, um, let's see here. here. One, One final, final stash. stash. Software. Software. And yep, yep, just just, just doesn't, doesn't want to do it. Do it. Okay. okay, we're just, we're gonna, just gonna move, move on, on without it. it. And it just, just uh, just, just move, move on without it. it. So, so I hope everyone's, everyone's doing, doing well, well today. today. And um, echo, echo, we are in echo. echo. Um, um, how about I do that? How about that? Then you're only getting the mic, and you should not be getting any double. Now you're getting double sound. We have sound. Okay, but I, that I know what's the problem is. The problem is that for some reason it, it takes the audio and then it loops it back on itself. So we should be back now. So we're going to jump into this, and uh, I hope everyone is ready to go. And what I've got here uh, is the... Um, Notes going forward here, and oops, go back to that. I want to open up uh, and see where we are. Um, I have a video now up, which is basically detailing uh, where we are at. If you see it on the re regular video stream, also this is much better. This is a much better look than last time. Uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, and so this file can be downloaded, and I have a video that goes over details. The only thing I didn't mention in the video is the fact that uh, as people will notice we do have levels passed. We do have levels that go past. Oh, that's the gold score. Where's, where's the level one? Uh, there's level one. We do have levels that go past 20. Uh, the classes will still be uh, 20 based, and then this is going to be something else we're going to do later, uh, probably with, dealing with epic destinies. And maybe somewhat generic. Okay, and we've dealt with skills and so forth. And we are moving into uh, going into what we we're talking about with combat. And uh, obviously, I haven't updated this because I spent the last two weeks getting Amethyst factions out. And so, what I'm looking at here is where we're going, uh, where we are currently with combat. And with combat, um, we've decided that uh, surprise is not going to change. Is my there. We're not going to be changing uh, most of combat. Combat is still going to be five E compatible. There's a few things we have. We're not establishing positions anymore. Um, uh, or is that? I mean, it's one of those situations where I'm going to look into combat here. Um, yeah, so we don't really need positions of combat. And um, we've have us we have dealt with surprise. Now currently, surprise doesn't give you much other than the the, the attackers get to go first. Uh, and nothing's more annoying than a surprise that doesn't work out. Uh, it's one of those situations. Yeah, well the thing is the fact here is I think initiative should have advantage or an edge. I think it should be advantage. 
uh, it does make it more powerful. I think because the, 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 a as a GM, I don't often do it. I think it's also mean to have players. Usually, I have them do an awareness check, and if they all fail, then they can get jumped, so they have a chance of 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 kind of cutting into the surprise. So then, they, so they don't have that issue. Uh, and if the players have advantage, nothing annoys a player group more than if they have surprise and it doesn't work, uh, or everybody misses and it turns into a because surprise should be. Because in the old days, I do believe, I can't remember if, uh, if, if the 3.5, 3.75 system did this. Um, but maybe I want to look into my path on um, whether or not, because the whole issue is back in the old days, you had something called, um, you had basically two types of AC. Uh, two types of AC was um, your regular AC and then your flat-footed AC. And I can't remember if Pathfinder still used it. Give me an idea how long it's been since I've actually played Pathfinder. And flat-footed AC is your AC without your dex bonus. This was an incredibly punishing rule because it meant that if you had an armor-based AC, your flat-footed AC didn't change. So your AC was just fixed. However, if you were a dex-based class, um, you didn't get your dex bonus to your AC. So your flat-footed AC would be lower. So if you were a dex-based fighter, if you were flat-footed, or oh, sorry, a, a class that was, that was dex-based, like a rogue, you were automatically crippled if you if someone if someone had to jump on you or if something happened and you couldn't use your dex bonus to AC. And so this punished only one type of build, the people that used their dex. And it was kind of unfair. So at some point they decided to not to do that. Um, I cannot remember whether or not because uh, I don't think there are any monster examples in, in Pathfinder, whether or not um, oh I did said that for a reason. Um, whether or not they still did flat-footed. Um, so that's the thing I'm curious about, uh, is whether or not they do flat-footed. I, I cannot remember. I'd be surprised if they still did it. Nope, they do. It is flat-footed. It is actually still a thing they do. Page 178. Um, yeah, so flat-footed. At the start of the battle, before you had a chance to act, you are flat-footed. You can't use your dex bonus to AC. So yeah, they... They pad this in, so if you were surprised, you were flat-footed. So anyone that used their dex bonus to AC didn't get it, so their AC was lower. And that was a way of um, of having surprise. Um, <clears throat> right, surprise and water, unaware, cleanse, and so forth. And that was a benefit to AC. However, um, because there's no such thing as flat-footed in 5e, and I have zero desire to put it in, uh, I can't see anybody um, dis wanting to include that. I, I think it's a really kind of dumb idea having another rule specifically for the purposes of screwing a specific type of character or monster. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so I think... Sorry about that. I'm suffering a little... Not, not, it's not a cold. It's a weird thing. But um, I personally, I think it's a bad idea. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to check a few things here. So, um, oh, this one. <laughs> No one needed to hear that. Okay, so I'm not putting it uh, flat-footed in, but I want to give Surprise a bit of an advantage. So, quite literally, I think the attacking side should have advantage um, until the group can act. Uh, if people think that's too powerful, we can make it an edge, but I think that should be uh, that should be how it should be done. Um, so, if there's no objections, okay. Uh, if there's no objections to that, Gazuntai, thank you. Uh, you an idea how, how delayed these messages can get. It's like a minute. So from, uh, as long as there's no, no uh, confusion or objection on that one, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, the types of actions. And we've decided that we weren't going to name actions. So there's going to be, everyone gets an action. There's no such thing as a full round action. Um, movement is no longer a move action. I was thinking about putting, uh, then we have your bonus, anything that's free, and then a reaction. So we basically, that's 
all we've done here change is that we remove the word action from bonus action. So it's an action, you have a bonus, your movement, anything, anything that's free, and then a reaction. And a reaction have a specific thing indicated. So it would be like reaction and it would say reflex or interrupt, right? And that basically brings in the fact that uh, in 5e, it's kind of assumed automatically that the rule would be a reflex, except there are a few situations where it says this occurs before the enemy acts. So they kind of threw it in as an exception, but the assumption is a reaction is a reaction. Um, but I want to make sure people are aware of the differences between a reflex and an interrupt. And a reflex occurs after the action, an interrupt stops, um, happens before the action occurs. So that's going through. And we've also established, this This doesn't change, obviously, we, but I want to make sure people are aware of how the rules work. Um, how many reactions would layers get? What do you mean? Oh, players. <laughs> layers, like layers? Uh, everyone, it, it's still just one reaction. So it's just, you know, players still get one reaction outside of a turn. Um, either reflex or interrupt. Uh, but you couldn't have both a reflex and an interrupt. So you basically still, so it's like 5e, you still only get uh, one reaction, but uh, it can be a reflex or an interrupt action, but you still only get the one reaction. Uh, obviously, some classes will affect that. Some classes, um, especially once we go into the classes and we start building some of these ideas, I think we're definitely going to be seeing. Um, classes like a fighter is going to have like I want to I want to throw in the idea of roles again so a fighter might have multiple different classes he could be a direct frontline uh, striker um, he can be a um, uh, a or a tank and the tank creates a situation where he if he, he makes it extremely difficult for enemies to um, uh, it may, it's hard for enemies to disengage from him and the original fourth edition, basically, you could impose this marked condition, and then this in marked condition, you took up a, a penalty. The character, the creature, took a penalty. Um, um, oh, sorry, I just got a message here. Uh, you took a penalty if that creature attacked anyone else but you, and that was a situation. And this creates a situation here where you can have multiple reactions if if a creature tries to move out of your a reach, for example. So we have swimming, climbing, difficult terrain, cover. We're, we're including cover uh, with the main rules. It, nothing, nothing's changing. Half cover, three quarters cover. Total cover cannot be hit. Uh, concealment, which is oddly enough in the movement say, space, uh, space, but we're going to put that into the hampered and disadvantage in here and so forth. Uh, hampered perception, disadvantage, that doesn't change. Uh, one of our, our new rules is that we are all putting in flanking. Now, flanking was something that was uh, implemented in a few situations. Uh, in 4e, it was very big, but 4e used the map, and they're not really enforcing the map with um, with 5e, even though a lot of people use the map. It, it's not 100%. Um, so how did... I'm wondering, because the map is not... So the map... So the, this is one of those situations where some players will use the board, and and... Some players don't. I generally don't, and most of my groups, whenever we're playing, especially in hard role-playing groups, in hard role-playing groups, uh, a lot of times they don't want to bother uh, unfolding the map. Now, 13th Age, for example, which was this fourth edition without the map, it was also, it was intentionally vague to the point there were only three types of ranges. You were either close, you were either you were either base to base, you're basically within melee, you were close, or you were long range. It was an entirely a vague uh, statement. Uh, I actually thought this was really good, but a really limited uh, range combat because there was nothing like either long range, normal range, and that was it. There was no set distance. So, is this target forty feet away? You wouldn't say that. You would say this target is in is long is is far away, and that would be it. And so you would move from one range category to another. So the idea, like. I'm moving 30 feet, I'm moving 35 feet. In 13th age, there was virtually no difference between the two of them. You would simply move from one step to the other step. It was a very interesting idea, and um, it was them to try to remove the idea of having to put a board. 
Now, Pathfinder, once again, 3.5 played with the idea. It still kind of had the idea of a board. And 4th edition was all board. That's why you moved squares and not feet. Now, Pathfinder, of course, their, their combat system assumes you're using a board because it gives you board examples. Now, when you go to 5th um, edition, you notice that uh, even though almost everybody online uses a board, they're not showing you the board. And that's because D&D is trying to move away from the tabletop, even though Pathfinder seems to still enforce it. I don't want to push the tabletop. So, of course, they had flanking here, but in flanking, it was quite literally very specific. One target to the other, you had to draw a line that, that intersects the base. We don't want to create that situation where players have to, are forced to do the board for flanking. So, basically, the rule was two or more attacking the same target. All, attack, all attackers have an edge. It's, so the edge, once again, we talked about, is edge is a plus two bonus. We've added this. Uh, it's in the modifier section down here. So you get a plus two bonus uh, if you're flanking. And the flanking simply means two or more attacking the same target. Two or more, well, make sure we see allies. <laughs> allies attacking the same target. All, all attackers have, all allied attackers have an edge. And that basically states that, unlike, um, I can't even show this thing because it'll probably, be, it'll probably warp itself out. In the Pathfinder version, you had to be direct base. In this situation, all three of these characters would be flanking. Um, yeah, you can't really see it, very unfortunately, very well. Um, but the, basically, that, that, that's, how the, that's how the old system worked. And um, we don't want to do that, so we are going to use a system where uh, all three of these characters, one, two, and three, they would all have flanking bonuses, where in the old Pathfinder, it would just be these two, but now all three would. Um, but do we allow range? And I don't think uh, it uh, does not allow range. I don't think we want to have range people because that creates a situation where everyone's always going to get a flanking bonus. And um, I think that's that's not a good idea. So it does not allow range. So you have to be flanking. You have to be melee. I get the same target um, in reach. Uh, we'll, we'll give them that. So if you have reach, you can flank if you have reach. But it does not allow range. Uh, we've added this X max range, which is double disadvantage. Another thing we talked about double disadvantage. Uh, and it's basically times for the long range. And this is basically implemented for firearms because arrows don't really have much for this. But I wanted to give the impression that you could reach beyond that normal range. So we've added this um, max range rule. Uh, opportunity attack tax don't change. Two up in fighting we have played with. There was definitely a lot of comments last week. Uh, or two weeks ago, we didn't, we didn't actually work last week, uh, regarding playing with two-weapon fights. Some people had a real problem with two-weapon fighting. Uh, and the fact that it's not terribly realistic. And people have said that it doesn't really work the way it's supposed to. Uh, in actual two-weapon fighting, um, your secondary weapon isn't often used as an attack. It's used as a deflection right as a as an alternative to a shield and in some situations you could switch it's the same thing with akimbo weapons a lot of people say um, if you ever look at firearm experts no one ever fires like this right or like that uh, it's usually firing this one weapon until it runs out and then you switch to another weapon a good example of this was val Kilmer, val, Kil val kilmer in tombstone when you see the fight of the ok corral he's got two pistols but you never, but you seldom or rarely ever see him fire both weapons at the same time. There's a great shot, and his weapons uh, are single action, which means you have to cock the weapon. So you see him uh, in, in a wonderful scene. Great, what a great movie! You see him uh, rolling back the, the the hammer and firing one weapon, and then he switches to the other weapon and fires. It's a fantastic scene. You've guys seen the, the the shootout in Tombstone. It's a great scene, but it's a great a great example of how Akimbo would probably really work. Uh, there's it actually is evidence in the historical game uh, GameStop not for game. There's a there's a YouTube channel that talks about the realism or lack of realism of Akimbo in games and how they actually do. And there's actually a lot of evidence of people who were used to firearms, but in almost every situation it was used as a, as a secondary, so you didn't have to reload a weapon. Um, we see it in movies a lot, but that's about it. Uh, but with melee weapons, there is also evidence of people using two melee weapons. But in in that situation. It was almost like the buckler. 
So a buckler is as is a is a is a small shield, and you so you would use your your blade as a as a deflection. So, um, what we have here is the rule is as a reaction, and it would of course be an interrupt reaction. Um, uh, you gain a AC bonus, right? Like a plus two AC bonus. And that's basically a pair reaction. But if you employ this AC bonus, you cannot use your bonus action on your next turn. Uh, so basically, th th this is something that we played with the idea of the fact that if you want to use two weapons, it'll work, go ahead. Uh, but then, but if you use your bonus action, you cannot. So you, get, you basically get to, you get to choose. If you're using your two weapon fighting uh, as um, as a deflection, which is what a real was supposed to be, then you don't get the opportunity of using the bonus action. Um, so, and this is one of those situations where a player goes, "I use my reaction to give myself a plus two bonus to AC." Does it still hit? Yes. Darn it! I don't get my bonus action next turn because I use my blade to try to deflect. Uh, so that's something we've added to increase uh, how two weapon fighting works. However, this is something we did. We wanted to make sure that shield became useful. Now, people were just like two weapon fighting. It's fantastic. I mean, you know, it gives you the advantage of attacking twice and so forth. We wanted to make sure that shield was useful. So a shield gives you your plus two AC. Uh, we also throw in the rule that if it's if it's a normal shield, a normal shield. Um, also provides half cover for people behind you. And that's once again, can someone can state, you know, whether or not this person is behind someone or not. Um, they provide half cover. Now, this is for any shield that's basically larger than a buckler. Uh, normal shield, which is basically, once again, larger than buckler. But uh, the other thing is that it nullifies flanking. So this is something that I thought was very interesting. Um, and we can throw this with monsters that have a type of defense that allows them to do this but if you have a shield uh you nullify this advance uh, this this benefit from flanking so when we have a situation where somebody is in a you know attacking a fighter or someone's being attacking players or so forth if a player has a shield they nullify that flanking uh we played with damage and healing uh we've removed instant death completely as someone has, has stated and it's absolutely true um Instant death is a specific rule where you take a certain amount of hit points. You um, are completely uh, you, you, you're completely killed if you take damage in a single hit equal to your full hit points. As a result, uh, that never happens to high-level characters because they have so many hit points. It would be really difficult for them to get hit once and suffer all of their hit points in, in a single hit. So as a result, the only time this ever happens is, is, is lower characters. So they're making it really easy to kill off low characters. And that's one of the biggest problems with D&D. It's very hard to kill top-level characters, and it's very easy to kill low-level characters, which can frustrate new players that are joining the game because they're getting their characters killed off. And then the players that have been around for a long time, they're very hard to, to, to kill. I want to create a situation where it's, it's not that much easy. I mean, yes, if you make it an even fight, Personally, if you make it an even fight, a low-level group and a high-level group should have the same odds of death. Um, and if you want to make it more difficult, you can always add a higher-level monster. But from that same standpoint, and the, the high-level characters can defeat more care, more types of creatures, and then the lower creatures are, are a cakewalk. But what I'm saying here is that we shouldn't. It shouldn't be easier to kill off a character at third level. Than it is at sixth level if you are if you have them engaged in equal um, level combat if, you, if, it's, if it's a CR three party and so forth. Uh, so we removed this rule specifically because we didn't want to play with instant death. Um, we, we it only applies to the little characters, so we've removed it. It has no bearing. There's no such thing as uh, instant death uh, within this uh, title, and unless people uh, have any objection. Uh, we're going to um, kind of uh, continue on past that. Uh, so, uh, okay, so with that out of the way, uh, we've also played with death to um, death saves. Death saves are like a 50 50 odds. 
Uh, now it, you get to add your con modifier to it. Makes sense. Why not make it a con modifier check? Um, we are not doing negative hit points. Um, and we, you still have, now the number of failures to die is your con modifier. That's the other thing. So if you have a constitution modifier of three, uh, you need three fails to, to, uh, to die. If, however, your con is 10, you need one. So it's a, a con, um, three failures, yeah, three successes stabilized. Oh, no, that's a number, number of failures. Uh, I don't know if this is a really great rule, because obviously it's going to be minimum one, because we don't want a situation. Yeah, that being said, someone has a 13 con. Yeah, so maybe I don't. Me, I don't want to do this. Maybe I won't do this. Um, I do like the idea of of, of, it, of it being your fort save or, or uh, a, a fort save for instead of a regular 50 50 chance. So we're moving negative hit points, three successes stabilized, three successes failed. Uh, unless, and this is something else we can do. Um, it's like two plus your con modifier, um, minimum one, so that everyone gets three automatically, but someone with an 18 con will have four instead of three. Uh, and that's one way of doing it. So that at 14, yeah, so it's, yeah, at four, that's six successes. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. That's one way of looking at it. So I, I'll leave that up to questions and see what people think about that. So what I mean is that, um, it's going to be either it's three successes, uh, well, sorry, three fails equal death, or it's going to be um, two plus your con modifier minimum one equals death equals dead. So that's going to be the question. I'll leave that up to the to people to comment. So basically, this 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 doesn't this means everyone gets the same chances. This one tells you that you're going to be it's either going to be three, but certain characters will have more. So once again, like I said, if you had an 18, it's four plus two. You you would need six failures to die, which would make it um, really difficult for a high con character to die. And I think that's fine. So no instant death. Doesn't check to stabilize. This was the big question, is adding in the bloody term. Now, bloody was something from 4th edition that created a scenario where, um, pardon me, that there was a threshold that was half your hit points, and all monsters had a bloody value. The only advantage of this is if you had super realistic rules like uh, uh, like Ultramax had systems that, that had tiers, and once you crossed a tier, you took penalties. Uh, bloodied in fourth edition was certain things would automatically trigger if you're bloodied this happens and with monsters this was very very easy because if you had a uh, an encounter based power or a power that didn't that took a long time to reset once you pass your bloodied value this power reset it made monsters a bit more powerful and also if you're if you're not using this ability that keeps on wanting to reset the moment the monster goes to bloodied value it does automatically reset and then off to the races you go. I want to include that back in. Uh, we still don't have any votes on whether or not we should. Uh, we're not using healing surges. We are doing hit dice. So hit dice uh, is still changing. Uh, that isn't changing. We're using it as before. Uh, the other question we were having was whether or not we were going to in establish initiative, or, um, uh, sorry, specifically whether or not we were defining encounters and battles. That was a question. So if we have an encounter or we have a battle. Um, and because that's one thing a fourth edition did, it had this definition of, of, a, of an encounter, and you had encounter based power, encounter based powers. My issue is that it creates a situation where players that have a fixed number of abilities, they're they're often like, I don't know if I want to use my I have three uses of this per day, and I don't want to waste it on here because I think I'm gonna get a big battle. And then you get to the end of the day and you never had that big battle, so you never get a chance to use that ability. Um, so I like the idea of having encounter-based powers once per encounter. Uh, so I think I think that. And I think someone's going to ask about non-combat encounters and combat encounters. And it'll be, it'll be co uh, combat 
a non-combat. And a non-combat is going to be a much more obscure set of rules. Um, I think a, a non-combat encounter would definitely be uh, a scenario where it becomes a role-playing scenario. And I don't know whether or not we should bother. It should just be combat or non-combat, uh, whether or not we should define non-combat. Um, right here, engine that you know, so. Uh, yeah, and the idea of combat, an, an encounter is, um, get that out of the way, it's going to be confusing. Uh, it ends when the GM says so. Five minutes between attacks, let the characters roll for initiative again. So that, the, the idea being is that a new combat encounter starts, uh, if, if, if there's, if there's no, if no one's doing an attack for five minutes, then the encounter is automatically over. If you roll initiative, you are starting a new encounter. Um, that being said, if somebody joins the group late and they roll for initiative, the encounter is beginning for them. But the idea is the fact that once a character rolls initiative again, they are starting a new encounter and they'll, so forth, they can have the opportunity to use uh, an encounter based ability again. So that's the question for those people who are just joining up whether or not we're going to define an encounter or not. Uh, the other question is we we uh, is whether or not we are going to use um, a fort save for um, for stabilization for death, and whether or not we can have a a larger number of, of death save if you have a higher constitution. So that's the questions we're asking for those people who are just joining in. Whether or not we're going to define encounters, um, I don't think we're going to do non-combat encounters. I think it'll just be combat or non-combat. Um, I think anything else can be done uh, as uses per day. So we may uh, remove that. And we are still kind of throwing in the idea of short rests and long rests. Uh, whether or not we'll have, I don't think we'll have daily power. We, we, I think mean, we have daily powers already kind of technically in fifth edition. And we're giving second wind, which is a, a fighter ability to everybody. So everyone gets to use second wind at least once. So now that brings us, we, we talked about, um, uh, we've had the, where are the modifiers? Oh, the modifiers we already explained. We have modifiers up here. And then we've stated already that an edge is a plus two bonus. Uh, if your superior is plus five, hampered is negative two, inferior is negative five, and then we have advantage. But you can also have double advantage and double disadvantage. Uh, and so these things stop. You can't get triple advantage. I still have this rule about being awesome. Uh, I still don't know if it's going to stay in there. Somebody mentioned it, and I figured, what the hell, we'll throw it in and make it stick. Um, and so before we jump into talking about other things like Max Mod, which is uh, the new uh, variation for uh, Dex Bonus to AC, I want to talk about conditions. Uh, conditions are, it's, it's very interesting, because when we got to 5e, 5e heavily limited the number of conditions. That you could get access to in in in, in variation of that it is unbelievable how many conditions there are in pathfinder uh give an example to one two three four five six seven eight nine uh 10 11 12 13 14 15 if you count exhausted when we look at uh pathfinder we have one two three four 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. That's, that's, and now, now that being said, some of these um, are very much repeated and certain things are like, for example, paralyzed and petrified are pretty similar. Um, these guys here, they don't have a dead condition. They have an unconscious condition. Well, in Pathfinder, they've defined a dead condition, like whatever. Uh, now, uh, so let's go through go through here. Blinded, go through conditions here. Blinded is not going to change. I can't can't see blinded changing at all. Um, so that one's unchanged. And then at that point, we have charmed. Now, oddly enough, if you can believe this, there's no charm condition in Pathfinder, which I think is very unusual. Uh, no charm condition in Pathfinder. Um, so 
Some condition is, yeah. So I guess we can make it unchanged. And then we'll go from there to, um, they have a condition called broken, which is just for um, items that have taken damage in excess of half their total hit points, gain a broken condition, meaning they're less effective in their designated tasks. Boy, do I, am I not interested in, in, in replicating that one, so I don't want to put that one in. After that, they have confused, while 4E has, uh, they have, what do we have? They're at deafened, so we're still at, they're confused. Uh, confused character mentally befuddled, cannot act normally. Now, um, their, their idea of confusion is kind of bizarre. Act normally, do nothing but babble incoherently. Deal one die damage to self with an item in hand. Attack nearest creature. That is such a bizarre... Like confusion could just simply be dazed or what have you. But they're confused is like you're you you don't even know what world you're in you're basically confused is the same thing as basically, basically being on a heroin buy or what have you and i can see why they would avoid that now there's a spell that does that um and it's basically almost verbatim i think of it if i remember correctly um Confusion. Like the confusion spell basically gives you the confused condition. They didn't define the confused condition. They just put it into confusion into the, into the confusion spell. So I don't think that there's a reason for confusion because it seems to be so uh, such a specific set of situations that it would only be implied that it would be some kind of spell like effect. Um, that being said, I don't see an issue with putting it in. Um, Pathfinder. Uh, the next after that is they have cowering. Uh, now, once again, this is something where um, they they have they have frightened condition, and for some reason, Pathfinder has both. It has a cowering and a frightened condition. Um, my thingy pop off to just ball. Right there. Um, so we have here the cowering character is frozen in fear, can't take no action. The cowering character takes negative two penalties, armor class, and loses dex bonus to any. Then frightened is a frightened creature flees from the source of its fear best it can. If unable to flee in the fight, frightened creature takes negative, negative two penalty attack roll, saving throw skill checks and ability checks. A frightened creature can use special abilities. Blah blah blah. When we look at Something that uses fear in 5e, like a dragon, um, it's just frightened. And in frightened, we have has disadvantage on ability checks, attack rolls. Creature can't willingly move close to the source. That seems fine. I don't think we need to have both cowering and frightened. I think that's kind of unnecessary. Then we have uh, we're not going to get the deafened yet because deafened we have dazed. We have. Frickin' Pathfinder. We have Dazed and Dazzled, if you can believe it. And in Dazed, a creature is unable to see well because... Oh, sorry. A, a creature is unable to act normally. A Dazed creature can take no actions but has no penalty at EC. A Dazed condition typically lasts one round. And then you have Dazzled. The creature can, is unable to see well because of over overstimulation of eyes. Oh my god, that's so unnecessary. Uh, so yeah, we're not doing Dazzled. Um, but this is something else I thought was interesting. The fact that there is no dazed. There is stunned, but there is no dazed. Now that being said, dazed here is un a dazed creature can take no actions, but you still get your bonus to AC. And the difference is, is that stun can take actions as well, but he also drops everything that they have. Where stunned in 5e um, is incapacitated, can't move, can't speak. So for me, there's we're missing something in between those, uh, and that's dazed. But dazed is almost exactly the same as stunned. It just lasts less. Now, if you remember 4E, what happened to 4E book? What? I do. 4E did stunned a little differently. Um, I actually like how they did it, and I will go into it in the moment I can find out where the hell the conditions are in this book. Um, 277. So here, uh, 
uh, as you can see, once again, to show people how the things of my 4A players in the book, to give you an idea how bad the errata was. Uh, their dazed was you grant combat advantage, which is how they did it. You can take either standard or move action or minor action on your turn, and you can't flank an enemy. Uh, and that was basically what 4A, 4A could do because they defined action. So I think we should put in dazed again. And dazed can is it basically means um, no reaction, no free uh, or bonus actions, and no bonus. We're not, not we're all bon no free or bonus. Um, can move or take an action. Cannot do both. The idea that you can you can continue doing your action, you can move or take action, cannot do both, and I think you have disadvantage on ability checks and uh, attack rolls. Rules, rolls. So that would be a day's condition. Um, it's the idea of the fact that you're limited what you can do. That being said, um, regardless of how long it lasts, you can recover days by taking an action. So no matter what happens, you automatically recover from a day's condition. Sorry. If um, if you just take your action. So you could have like your days for one minute or days until they make a saving throw and then your turn. You could just say, no, I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm just gonna take an action and recover from it automatically. So you recover automatically. So it's not something that's nearly as bad. You can still do an action. If you're in melee combat, you get days, you get disadvantage on your attack rolls, but you could still attack, you could still out. So that's what I think we should do with a days condition. Uh, so that's something we are putting in. I'm not putting in dazzled, I'm not putting in dead, which brings us to uh, deafened. Deafened, I don't think, is going to change here at all. Uh, can't hear automatic fails, ability checks. Oh, and all that crap. Okay, so deafened is not going to change. Um, this is where things get interesting. They have disabled, which we're not going to do. Dying, which I don't think we're going to do. I don't think we need to worry about the dying condition. And so we're not doing negative hit points. And they also have energy drained. Um, once again, it's it's entirely explained in another section. So now we get to entangled or grappled. Now, um, once again, this is where things get a little strange. Pathfinder has both grappled and entangled. And I agree, we absolutely don't need both. Um, grappled is restrained uh, by a trap or a creature. They cannot move and take a negative four penalty to dexterity. Grappled creature takes a negative two penalty on attack rolls and combat maneuver checks, except those made to grapple or escape a grapple. Uh, with grapple here, a grapple creature speed becomes zero. It can't benefit from the bonus with speed. The condition ends if the grappler is capacitated. The condition also ends if the attack removes the grapple creature from the reach of the grappler effect, such as when the creature is rolled away by the fender waste spell. Um, so that's grappled. Um, can I use stealth? That seems pretty kind of obvious. Uh, now, they're uh, entangled. Uh, impedes movement does not entirely prevent it unless the bonds are anchored to an immovable object or tethered by an opposing force. An entangled creature moves at half speed, cannot run or charge, and takes negative two penalty on attack rolls. Um, I don't think that's terribly necessary. Uh, that's something I'll leave whether or not we'll... I mean, that's the difference between being in, in, uh, incapacitated or... I mean, it's one of those situations where that's... Ah, okay, I can see why we would have a situation where um, we could have something that is immobilized, right? Um, but it's not necessarily entangled. Um, but the thing is that we don't really need to have that as a condition. You can just say you're moving through half cover or your movement is zero. Uh, I don't think we need to add a condition for that. Um, so I think we'll leave that unchanged.
so that leaves us to their incapacitated is incapacitated, can't take actions or reactions. Now, oddly enough, Pathfinder does not have incapacitated, which I think is interesting. They have exhausted. Now, exhausted is a, is a series of effects, and I'll keep it with that, so exhaustion is not going to change. I'd actually just do exhaustion is unchanged. Uh, I like the tears, um, personally, so I don't think we're going to change that. Grappled, uh, what else do we have? Entangled, exhausted, fascinated. I think fascinated is basically the same thing as charmed, so we're not going to bother with that. Uh, fatigued, we would talk about, we just talked about fatigue. Flat-footed, we're not going to deal with. Frightened, uh, we're not changing frightened, we just talked about that. So frightened is unchanged. Um, my CD gets the best of me here. So grappled is unchanged, uh, frightened is unchanged. Gravel is unchanged. Uh, helpless. I don't know about helpless. I can see the benefit of helpless, but I don't think we need it. Because um, you, have, you have the paralyzed condition, and the paralyzed condition basically covers that. So I don't think we need helpless. Um, so we will jump from uh, helpless. Uh, we're into invisibility. No, of course not. They have incorporeal. Or why we need to have that. So I think we will. Oh, I lost my camera. Hope we're still going. We're still going. Okay, we're back. Not sure what happened there. So invisible is going to be unchanged. Um, their invisibility is basically unchanged anyway. Now uh, this is okay. So now we're moving into nauseated. Nauseated is um, not in five e. And this is something we have poisoned. And, and 3.75. So I wonder whether or not nauseated and poisoned are basically the same thing. Um, unable to attack, cast spells, concentrate in spells, or do anything else required. Uh, the only action you can take is single move actions per turn. Um, poisoned, you have disadvantage on attack. So it, poisoned is not nearly as bad as nauseated. It seems to be way worse. Um, but we're not going to remove any 5e conditions, so poison is going to be unchanged. However, um, I think there is an argument for adding something else. Now, that being said, we kind of jumped the gun here. Uh, paralyzed. Oh, I can't spell paralyzed today. Paralyzed. Uh, and that's not going to change. And panicked, once again, it's like, what's, like why put panicked? And cowering and frightened. That just seems so worthless. That's the reason why I always had issues with 3.75. There's just too many conditions. Um, so paralyzed is, is not going to change. Uh, petrified. I've always wondered why we had petrified. I mean, that's... Because that's, that's a very specific thing. Because you basically get turned to stone. It is such a specific... That being said, uh, unchanged... Though worded to not to not always be magical. That's one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to make a change to petrified so that it's not automatically considered to be um, a magical effect. Because petrified, you turn to stone. It's an entirely magical effect. I want to reword that. I'm not ha sure how we're going to reword that now, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll it'll get reworded. It'll say like, let's see how do I do it here. Um, Petrogeist creature um, is frozen in subcapacity. You know they can be turned to they can be turned to ice. They can be turned to stone. They can be encased in a force field. 
Um, but here, like, it increases the factor of 10, ceases aging. That's something that you can say is a monster effect. The fact that they put in petrification. I think that is an artifact from the old days where saving against petrification was its own saving throw. Like, it was, like, saving against petrification. It was just such a bizarre, specific thing. Considering only, like, two creatures did petrification, it's weird that they have a condition specifically. Um, I, I wonder, actually, is... Not that I'm going to, but I'm curious whether or not there's another word we can use for petrification. Um, I mean, petrified, I mean, I can, actually, we could just call this frozen, right? Like, why don't we call it frozen? There isn't a frozen condition, is there here? Nope, no frozen condition. Why don't we call petrified frozen? It seems that that would cover all of our bases. Um... So that's what I want. I'd like to change petrification to frozen. Because I think it would just make more sense. Because it would be less automatically. Like petrification is being turned to stone other than the word petrification of uh, being fossilized or what have you. And um, calcified, which is going into, this, into a thesaurus. That's basically the words will pop up, fossilized or, or, or so forth. Um, and that goes on to, um, we're off of petrification, and now we're doing pinned for 3.75, which is, once again, worthless. We don't need petrification. Sorry, to be pinned. Uh, we're not going to remove the poison's location, but poison's still going to be involved. Um, prone, we have prone, and prone will be unchanged. Oops, nope. Unchanged. Can't see having to change uh, print. Um, yeah, options to crawl, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if then from prone, we, they move to restrained. They move to shaken. We added dazed already. I don't think we need to add a shaken on top of that. But this is where things are interesting. They added a second condition. And this is one of those situations where um, I think we need a second condition just because poisoned is nice, but I think, like, sickened is the same as they're poisoned. So it makes me wonder whether or not we should have a sickened condition that's the same as nauseated or something like that, where uh, you're you know, unable to act uh other than other than movement i think that's something to consider um i'll leave this up to question uh maybe i'll post this up I'll, um to talk to a group i think uh, i'm going to finalize this section but i'll leave this section for open for people to uh to to, to check on and maybe i'll post this in in the discord as well so people are, are aware of the question so they have sickened uh, we put in sickened uh at that point it's restrained now restrained, um, restraint, restraint is they're entangled basically. Um, so, so I don't think we're going to change that, and we didn't actually put in entangled here. Uh, so restraint will be unchanged. They don't have restraint obviously because they have entangled. At that point, I see we have shaken, sickened, stable. We don't bother with the word stable. Um, staggered. Once again, it's the same as our dazed. And then we get to stunned. Uh, and stunned is basic advantage. It's basically unchanged between both of them. Then they go from that to unconscious. And at that point, it's basic. We, we, we know what this is. Unconscious, boom, unchanged. So we're not going to bother changing that as well. So those are our conditions. I don't know whether or not there were any um other ones regarding um 4e that were important and if you think there are other conditions we should add uh please uh mention in the comments that noise is my degus um i don't think so they have slowed as well we have blinded, dazed, deafened, dominated. Um, 
which once again is a very specific thing which we can put into uh, spells or what have you. Helpless Immobilized Marked. Uh, since that's going to be very a very specific ability, I don't think we need to have it as um, as a condition. It'll just be explained in the combat section. Uh, petrified, we talked about that. Prone, Restrained, Slowed. I kind of liked Slowed. It says your speed becomes 2. Um, I, have to, I think it's very specific. Uh, it also adds in, in the errata, we have, uh, you cannot benefit from bonuses of speed, although you can use powers and take actions, just as a run action you, uh, that allow you to move farther than your speed, blah, blah, blah. Um, I like the idea of slowed. They also have weakened, you, where, you, where your attacks deal half damage. Oh, my, um, the errata says your attack deals half damage, however, two kinds of damage that you deal are not affected. Ongoing damage and damage that isn't generated by an attack roll. Those are not affected. That was the big uh, addition in the errata. Um, I, I like Weakened. It's a neat idea. Uh, I like Slowed. So, but the question is um, whether or not we should add Slowed or Weakened. Now, why we did make things simplify. So far, all we've done so far, all we've done is add in dazed and potentially sickened. Um, now, slowed, I don't think is going to be movement two. I think it's just movement half. And weakened would be half damage. Uh, I like these. I mean, it's one of those situations where we're not going as crazy as uh, as Pathfinder. I mean, we've added four new. We haven't added that many. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Now we have nineteen. Um, like I said, it comes down to the point where I would even think of removing petrification as a condition. Like that's something. That, petrification is so unique. Um, they do it very specifically so they don't have to explain the petrification, which to my knowledge, how many monsters petrify? The Gorgon and the, Med and the Medusa, which is in mythology the same creature, but it's not in D&D, where the Gorgon is another type of thing, right? And the best part is, if you look at Petrifying Breath in 5e in a book, it says the target just turns to stone and is restrained. It doesn't say petrified. So why in the world did they add the petrified condition if they're not going to use it on the Gorgon? I just I don't understand why they why they had to use that for, for wording. Now if we go to the Medusa, is there a Medusa? Okay, my my brain is um I can't remember whether or not they actually put in the Medusa. Okay, I, so, so, okay, so the Medusa as a creature isn't... Oh, it isn't. Okay. Um, yeah, so only... So it's not even the Gorgon. It's not even in the Gorgon. Petrification is only used by the Medusa. The Gorgon... And this is one of those situations where someone's going to say it deals with... Um, uh, so yeah, so to answer your question, that we are playing with uh, with 5e rules. We're just trying to see about, this is just a thought experiment uh, about trying to find new and interesting ways of creating a variant system that is inspired by 5e. Um, it's just a fun little experiment we're playing with. We've been doing this for a couple of weeks. Uh, so Medusa, it says, uh, if you fail the saving throw, before it's made these things, Okay, so if it fails by five or more, the creature is instantly petrified. That's the rule. And that's the only time that I actually see the word petrification in the monster manual, because the Gorgon doesn't impose petrification. Otherwise, a creature that fails to save begins to turn to stone and is restrained. The restrained creature must repeat the saving throw at the end of each turn, becoming petrified on a failure or ending the effect on success. The petrification lasts until the creature is freed by the greater restoration spell or other magic. 
I think personally that that's, it feels like we don't really need to have that as a condition, do we? I mean, if we're trying to limit the number of conditions to prevent people from being confused, it seems weird that we would, um, it's, it's one of those situations where it, I don't, I don't see the point. I mean, I, I can keep it in there and I think reword it as being frozen. So it can act in multiple ways, but I don't think we need to play with that. But the question is whether or not I want to put in sick and slowed, weakened or unconscious. Um, Elle, I don't know what your point is, but aren't white males supposed to get out of the entire hobby, not just D&D? &D? That's what Hasbro said. Um, also, what are your views on Strahd in CC versions yesterday, but not allowed in the OGL version? Uh, so, first of all, the first comment, I don't know. That's supposed to be inflammatory, so I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, what are your views on the Strahd and the, and the and CC version of SRD? Um, so, the, it, I think it was a bit of a confusion part on, on, on their idea, the fact that I think you can mention them, but you can't use their illustrations. The same thing is the same thing with uh, the mind flayer and the beholder. Now, when it comes to what my views on it are on, I I'm a point where I don't I don't really care to be perfectly honest. I don't really care because I'll never in my life make an adventure that you that needs to that that where where I would want to use Strahd by name, right? I would you know I can see making an adventure that's in classic D and D where I would include the beholder. Or I would include a mind flare, but even then, I generally won't. Um, I don't know. I saw Kyle Brink. Uh, he did a, a he did an interview on um, I can't remember what the channel was called. Um, I, I I didn't I didn't watch the whole thing because I I I don't don't know if he can say anything new that I haven't already learned from the dozen of other channels that have gone around, and I just didn't have time um, to to go through it now. So going back to what I was saying about Strahd, um, did they do it intentionally? They might have did it uh, spontaneously, not realized. Um, but I think, I, I, for me, I'm a person who likes creating original content. Because I like creating original content, I don't like the idea of using named creatures unless it's uh, got a, myth a mythological comparison. So Strahd is, is such a... He's such a, uh, I want to say vanilla. He's, he's like, he's like vanilla. Wow. He's just a vanilla vampire. He's just, I'm a vampire. I'm the vampire. Everyone knows. He's, you quite literally can call him Dracula. And if I'm going to have Strahd, I might as well just have Dracula. Because Dracula is public domain and everyone knows Dracula. Um, and so I don't, I don't see the, so whether or not it's legal, whether or not we can use Strahd in, in, in a third party pr product, I don't know. I would never do it, but I would never do it, not necessarily because of copyright. I get stopped because it's not original, and so I'm not interested. Um, and so uh, I'm not interested in Strahd. Uh, uh, Beholder, same thing. Uh, uh, they can have their mind flares and Beholders and Mimics. I can, I can easily make a lot of fun adventures without having to do it. And you can have Shape Changers without playing with the idea of the Mimic. You could still have that. There are certain things that are very signature um, you know, gelatinous cubes or what have you. Um, I don't think they're going to really care if I put a gelatinous cube in an event, in an adventure. Uh, but Strahd is a, is a named character. Yes, three black halflings. That that was the channel. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, I I saw the link because I'm I'm on like a dozen different D and D groups and role playing groups. So if somebody is um. If there's an interview or anything important, then guaranteed I've seen it. Uh, so yeah, about a dozen people have already shared the, the Three Black Halflings channel. But it's an hour, and at the time I didn't have time, and I'll probably sit down and watch it once I... Like, I'm doing a layout right now on an adventure, and I can usually do two things at once. So I can listen to uh, to that interview, but I predict it's not going to say anything that I didn't already suspect or didn't already know. And I'm not, and I'm not going to think uh, that he's going to say anything that's going to be, oh, this changes everything. I, I don't, I don't think that. I remember I'm also you're talking to a guy that never took, like I was, I was on the, I was on the side of of the open open D and D movement. Um, I had the open D and D image uh, on my company page and my personal page for a while. It's revolved back to a regular one. Uh, so I've been part of that movement, even though I fully admitted that the controversies barely affected my company because of how we do things. Like we create 
original products that don't copy paste the SRD. So a lot of the OGL, like technically we didn't have to publish for the SRD. And because of the derivative rules in copyright, we could still do that. Hey, how'd RPG? A little late to the game. Um, but I will let you look at the screen. This is what we want to do for, um, I'm going to reduce this in size so you can see it. Um, that's a bit too much. Uh, so you can see what we're, what we're planned on. We're doing conditions right now. Uh, this is the first time I've seen your channel. I didn't even know I had a company. Uh, oh, yeah. So I am a publisher first and foremost. Um, I publish, I don't have my Ambitus books here, but everyone knows me for this one. Uh, I did Ultra Modern 5. So I did Ultra Modern 5, uh, regular at the redo. I have the Amethyst books. And somewhere over there is my the Affinity Trilogy, which is heading out to Kickstarter backers right now. And I just finished the one for Amethyst. Do I even have this book here? I do. I don't have um, quick book advertising time. Yeah. So this is Amethyst Faction. This is the second book in the series. Amethyst Quintessence is uh, the first book. This is 5e. If you don't like 5e, I have Amethyst. Uh, the core systems, Factions and Quintessence, are also available for uh, 4e Pathfinder, 5e, 13th Age, Savage World, and Fate. Uh, so six different systems, or five or six different systems. Um, for uh, the new book, Revelations, which is coming out this year, which I'm working on right after this uh, module I'm doing is done. That will be uh, 5e, Fate, and Savage World. And that's because Fate and Savage World is being done by uh, another person. Uh, but this is the biggest project, both the Ultra Modern 5 original one in 2016, and then the 20, and then this is the 2020 version, which is Redo, which is about 150, 200 pages more than the original one. And it's in, and it's in full color. Can't we really see it there, but it's in full color. Um, and it's also more up to date. Uh, Affinity Neurospasta Apex are our settings. Neurospasta is cyberpunk. I had one of the first cyberpunk settings out there. Apex is superheroes, and Affinity is a triple setting: uh, high sci-fi, mecha, uh, high uh, kind of techno fantasy, and in steampunk. And no one's really done. Um, uh, don't worry, man. Ask your questions. It's okay. Uh, I, 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 no, there's no such thing as a noob in this area. We, I'm always open to having open conversations with everybody, but, um, that was, that's just the, that's the, that's the arrangement. Amethyst came out first. Amethyst actually has all of the ultramodern books. You need ultramodern for Amethyst, um, first you need it. You need ultramodern five for Apex, Neurospasta and Affinity, uh, but you don't need it for Amethyst. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, but if you ever ask around, I don't make small books. In fact, one of the things uh, I brought a, I brought a new collaborator, a guy named William Miller. He has his own company. We're going to be working together. Um, I don't know whether or not we're going to be publishing his work through our, our channel. We're still talking about that. Uh, he has his own complete adventures that he makes entirely on his own. And through him, we've decided we're going to be publishing some smaller books, but I am not known for my small books. For example, this is Amethyst Factions. Amethyst Factions, this is the old version of Amethyst Factions. It's 456 pages. The new revised version that just went online yesterday, it's uh, just, it's just, it uses it's the font a bit better. It's not nearly as spaced out. So it's 416 pages. It doesn't, but there's actually more content in it. And then Quintessence is 400 and 404 pages. Revelations will probably be between 375 and 400 pages. Ultra Modern is 397. Uh, the original one, I think, was only 220 or so. Uh, but that, um, if you if you buy Ultra Modern Five on Drive Through RPG, you also get a bunch of extra stuff: um, a fillable character sheet, all the maps in high resolution, and I have these DLCs which are available for sale. I've done two so far. One's called Game Feats, which is a list of just feats that are inspired by video games, and one that's called Desert Power, which gives you uh, items and technology from the Dune movies. You get those for free if you if you buy drive if you drive the ultra modern if you buy ultra modern five redo you actually will see those files contained uh, in that download directory. But I think you get like fifteen downloads uh, from ultra modern. So that's basically that that out of the way. Uh, so anyway, so we're back talking. We're going to quickly revise and talk about uh, um, uh, our conditions while we have people here. So um, we're not changing any of the conditions that five E introduced, but my idea is to. Um, Add in a days condition, sickened, 
weakened, slowed, and then rewording uh, petrification so it's not automatically turned to stone. That's been the big thing. And I want, I'm, I'm probably going to throw this in the Discord group so people can see it and um, they can decide whether or not they want to go, if, if they're good, whether or not we should remove these or what have you. That's going to be the big question for this thing. Because I think after that, we are basically done combat. Um, and I don't know whether or not we'd be diving into um, uh, equipment before we do classes. I don't think, uh, as we kind of go over it very quickly, um, I don't think we're going to muck with it. In with the one, one slight difference, and that is the max mod. And the idea that instead of being 11 plus your dex modifier, it's actually 11 plus your max mod, it's called, or max mod. And max mod means your maximum attribute modifier. Uh, so that means it's not always dex. And this allows people who have a high intelligence to, they can use their intelligence instead of dexterity. In fact, we looked through it and said we, we could justify dex, wisdom, constitution. We could justify all of them but charisma. And I didn't want to go, well, once again, charisma the dumb stat. So I said, you know what? No, we'll we'll make it max mod. So you can add your charisma bonus to your AC if you want to. Maybe you're just so handsome and so charismatic that this person doesn't want to hit you. <laughs> and I'm sure some people have some objections to that, but I think max mod is a great idea. And we talked about it last time, and I think that's a good idea. Uh, and so that's not going to change much with armor. When we do weapons, uh, damage type's not going to change. I don't think it, it ever changed. I don't think it even changed in Pathfinder. Because um, Pathfinder, I think, still also has the damage capacity. That being said, and this is something where I'm not even going to make it. This is not even going to be difficult. When we got to Ultra Modern, and specifically these got heavily revised in um, Taurus, which is one of the Infinity modules, we expanded on... Um, the rules. So we added rules for uh, for small arms, right? Um, and dealt with rules uh, to add a small arms thing. And, and, uh, and we we play, we kept the rules for reloading from from Dungeon Master's Guide, but we uh, we basically added new rules and like other other attributes like the like nuclear grenade rules and so forth. So we can just move all that stuff over. Um, but I think the rules don't need to change. Versatile, finesse, throne. I don't think there's anything within equipment specifically that has raised a red flag, personally. Um, slashing. Yeah, I don't think, unless anyone has any questions, I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, reach, uh, cause they made it pretty simplistic. So reach, range, loading, that's the biggest thing. So loading changed heavily because they don't have any um, uh, rules regarding anything that's clip or ammunition based. Loading is gonna get heavily shifted. Uh, loading doesn't change, but we're gonna be adding stuff for, for clip, for feeding, for uh, single action weapons and so forth. But that's just being kept copy pasted from Taurus. So if uh, so, people will see that in the rules. It'll just be copy pasted from Taurus. Um, I, I have a little bit of an issue with voice. Oh, you seem to have lost me again. Oops. I don't know what's going on with the audio. Uh, so anyway, uh, have you combined restrained and the grappled condition? Um, no. Uh, the funny thing was is that in I was earlier in the video I was looking at the uh, Pathfinder book. And in the Pathfinder book, they have four different conditions um, r related to uh, being unable to move. And it feels really weird that they did that. Now, 5e simplified it, and they created grappled and restrained. And I don't think uh, we need 
anything more than that, but I don't know whether or not I want to combine restrained and grappled. Um, I mean, I can see getting rid of grappled, but not restrained, obviously. Um, I wonder if there's a big delay in the chat when seeing all these comments from on this. So they just got a bunch of messages just dumped all at once. So it makes me wonder whether or not there was an issue with the um, with the stream and that things got frozen for a second. Uh, the other question, do I have bad hay fever? Uh, I, um, I have a bit of, I think I'm getting over a cold. I'm not sure. But see, grapple, the creature speed becomes zero. Restrain your PM zero. And then it ends if you're incapacitated. You know, yeah, you're right. I don't think we need grappled. I think we can get rid of grappled and just have restrained. I think we can do that. Because I think we get rid of that and we just have restrained. And restrained, restrained plus grappled. Uh, so grappled will be merged into restrained. Okay, I think it's a good idea. So I think we'll do that. Um, what about condition spir um, spirited? Where the player's spirit is separated from their body in the astral plane. This could be either forced on them or on them. No. Now, I do know I do know that there is an ethereal condition in 3.75. Um, but once again, um, I don't know whether or not we need like I, I, want, I think conditions should be indicated as conditions if they have a lot of application, which is the reason why I'm rewriting uh, petrified to be frozen so it can encompass a lot of other possibilities. But the idea of um, of, of petrification, even though it's only said apparently once in all of Monster Manual, it's just for the Medusa. The Gorgon doesn't actually have petrified by name. He just turned to stone, but doesn't have to say the word uh, petrified. And when you go to Medusa, it says petrified, but it goes through so much detail, you might as well just explain what the condition is at that point. So that's why I'm changing petrified to frozen. And I've added sickened, uh, slowed, and weakened. And then I've added dazed. Most of these are carried over from 4E, um, just because I think I, I like... But I think stun doesn't do enough. Um, so yeah, I would much... So I think 5... See, Pathfinder has way, way too many conditions. But I think 5E doesn't have enough. I think we need a couple extra. Okay, so... That was... See, okay, so anyway... Um... So yeah, we're we'll we we'll got rid of we we'll got we got rid of restrained. Um, talking about confused now, the funny thing about confused is that the confused in Pathfinder is very weirdly specific. Um, I've been confused at times, but I've never attacked myself or attacked a friend, and, and so the idea of confused is so vague. But they decided to spe specify. Now in Five E, they know. That there is only one time that the confusion spell really confusion really applies, and that's when you get a confusion spell. So it was I, I understood their logic going, why do we have the confused condition when it only has one or two applications, the confused spell and maybe one or two monsters? So why not simply say this person is under the effects of a confused spell, and then you don't have to make it a condition. It only applies when the confused spell gets used. And I think that's the reason why they took Confused out. Yeah, so Confused is in Pathfinder. And if you look at the rules for Confused in Pathfinder, it's almost verbatim the Confused spell in 5e. So I think what 5e was trying to do was that if it's a specific condition that only happens once or twice, don't put it as a condition. Just say, look at the spell that imposes the condition. And that's why Confused isn't a condition, it's just a spell. And so someone can be affected by the same effect as a confused spell. In the same case, uh, for example, the one of the good dragons. And the good dragons has, I think, a weakening breath. And there could be a confused breath, but I do know one of them has a weakening breath. And it explains it's, it's the same as this weakened spell. And so that's how that's kind of how 5e, when you really look at 5e kind of hides more conditions within spells. Um, I'm kind of kind of discovering this as a as a, as a as realizing as, as I'm saying it because yeah that's that's exactly how they did they cut down all the conditions from Pathfinder by by saying just reference the spell because it only happens in this spell uh, and I can see 
doing that still. So for, for things like petrification, um, or which is, which is then odd, the fact that petrified is still a condition, even though there is probably a, a turn to stone spell, if I remember correctly, but they didn't say this person is under the effect of a turn to stone spell. You could have just said that and not had the petrified condition. Um, so that's why I'm even to the point of, of getting rid of that one, uh, petrified entirely, and just having, okay, you're just, you know, incapacitated. And incapacitated could be the same thing. Petrified specifically says you stop aging. Everything has advantage. Creature resistant to all that. I just, I don't think we need it. Can we get rid of that? You know, I, I think just, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's way, 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 way too specific. So I'd like to get rid of petrification because it's it's going to get it's going to get you know if you're petrified you can just re reference the turn to stone spell and once again so we're reducing the number of, of conditions but we've added a few more so we've removed grappled and we've removed petrification but we've added dazed sickened slowed and weakened and I think that's that's useful because weakened specifically says half damage slowed is movement half and sickened, uh, unable to act other than movement, and dazed is uh, a kind of a natural reaction of being kind of struck hard or what have you. Um, so uh, can you use dexterity or strength uh, for an arms I always found when fighting in martial arts that speed and weight, oh, speed plus weight equals force. Um, can you use dexterity or strength? Um, so I know once again, referring to my lovely um, story book, which has gotten nothing, that there was the rules for unarmed strike in that book. And that one, I do believe, said it could be either um, skill training with skills, it's in combat. I didn't realize how far back combat was. Good lord. Okay. Um, combat, and it should be right. But they had a, there was a section for, the, for your basic attack. Um, so they had a basic attack power. And the basic attack power, you got to use your dexterity or your strength. Um, and that was basically a way for you to... Have, oh, yeah, there it is. It's, it's way back further than I thought. So there was a melee basic attempt. No, never mind. It, it was only strength. There we go. I actually... Um, it was only strength. And the basic range attack was always dex. Yeah, so that was dumb. Um, so we have... Going to 5e... An arm strike is one damage bludgeoning. So basically, you know, there's only one way to fix this. Uh, I always found when fighting in martial arts that speed plus weight equals force, so either results is a hit and injury. There's an easy way of doing that. Why don't you simply make an arm strike a light attack? Like, why isn't it light? Why isn't it, like... And light and finesse. Like, why is it? Like, it's weird that unarmed strike doesn't have the light and finesse property. It weighs nothing. So, so that's an easy. That's an easy fix. Like, um, let's go back to uh, to weapons here, uh, to equipment. Um, unarmed strike gains finesse and light. Um. And someone's going to say, Monk gets that, but everyone should get that. That's, kind of, that's an obvious thing. I think everyone knows that the fact that if a dagger is a finesse weapon, then an unarmed strike should be a finesse weapon. Like, like, um, oh, God, um, right, I'm going to make a really stupid joke about that. Um, so, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm mostly asleep. Sorry about that. Petrification paralyzed are very similar. So yeah, we're merging that. Makes no sense that unarmed strikes don't operate like finesse weapons of 5e, which is what we're talking about. And there's a possibility of wisdom being used to avoid application of strength in a fist fight. Um, well, I, we, we talked about max mod. You can use your wisdom for your for your bonus to AC. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. Um, 
And there is a possibility of wisdom being used to avoid the application of strength if this way. You may think you explain now what you mean by avoid the application of strength. Unknown strike should also be versatile, and I and and you know you know what that is. Like versatile is not because 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 a weapon is basically using two hands for an attack. So if you're doing versatile, you know what you're doing. You're doing the Kirk hammer punch. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you ever read uh, one of Sh uh, one of Shatner's Star Trek books, he was something that he 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 just thought of of the Kirk hammer punch and the Kirk hammer punch is you interlocking your fingers and slamming down your fist. Except he said, if you do that, you'll break every finger in your hands. <laughs> it's a horrible idea to interlock your fingers. Because even if you, even if I apply a little pressure to a hit, I'm hurting my fingers. So the answer is no. <laughs> I didn't think we're going to put the versatile property for unarmed strikes because it's the Kirk Hammer Punch. And there's a part of me that's something to say, you know, if you... If you want to use versatile, you can, but you're going to take half damage in return. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the monk is going to be probably closer to the martial artist uh, from Ultra Modern because I want to strip the the, the 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 wushu elements from monk. I think I like monk as an idea, but a monk is a bit too wushu, and I like wushu, but there should be like should be a subclass. Like a wushu monk should be a subclass, not the whole class. Make a martial artist. And then have all these awesome subclasses. And with um, I did martial artist, the subclass was uh, a grandmaster, and you got to pick one of like fifteen different martial arts types. So I had monkey fighting and all this stuff, and you got all these cool abilities, you know, like Iron Fist. And I had like it was like a whole section here. I'm gonna blatant uh, self promote again here. Uh, I'm going to look at it outside of that. It is in, not in equipment. It's not there. It is, where is it? Grandmaster, Grandmaster, Grandmaster. Yeah, so the Grandmaster abilities, you could pick uh, a Kaparea, Drunken Boxing, Eagle Claw, Karate, Iron Palm, Iron Shirt, Long Fist, Monkey Kung Fu, Muay Thai, Praying Mantis, Snake Style, Tai Chi, Taekwondo, or, or Tiger Claw. Now, obviously, the majority of these are Chinese, um, but obviously we have some uh, Thai and some uh, Japanese in there as well. But a lot of these are different Kung Fu styles. And I could throw in a couple more that are pseudo-magical, right? And allowed stuff like leaping and, and the virtual flying and kind of going into Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon route without going in the full monk. And that's one thing we can talk about when we, once we do into go into classes. But yeah, so that's one thing we've changed here. Unarmed strike, uh, fitness, finesse, and light property. So that's one thing we've done. So max mod, unarmed strike are the only thing so far I think we've modified. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, so that's that's the proposal um, how to RPG uh, for monk. We'll, 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 I think monk will be very different. Because I don't think it'll be a monk for one thing. Um, so I think that's, like I said, we're not going to touch spells until we get to wizard. And I think I'm going to do that last because I know it's going to, I'm going to hate it. Um, so I think after that, we are going to look at probably species. And that'll be very quick. Um, because we're just going to basically throw down what the benefits are going to be. Um, I never had an issue with an arm strike for all clouds except for a monk. Um, one plus ability modifier for damage. Um, you never had an issue with it being one plus modifier? Um, I mean, yeah, I can see that. I mean, it's one of those situations where... It, I don't know. Something tells me it should be one die four, but I know it shouldn't be. Like, what's... I mean... Because the club, the club does one die four already, and you imagine that a club would do more damage than a fist. But so yeah, I mean I can see it being one damage. I think monk st uh, being just for monks is worth considering. Um, yeah, so once again with the martial artist class that we'll create, one of the fighting styles will be I could call it wushu, and that would carry over some of the things that we know from monk. It wouldn't give you a lot of combat abilities. Because martial artists is heavy, heavy in combat. There's no pseudo uh, magical or religious aspects to it. 
it would just be um I used monks I used monks so um seldomly I actually can't remember all the things that they imposed. Uh so like like the like if, for for wushu it would be <clears throat> you would get stuff like the the martial artist is going to get any all the physical stuff but stuff like purity of body deflect missiles slow fall and all those stuff that's going to be the stuff that we would throw in for the monk subclass uh and then the rest of it would just be um yeah so deflect missiles slow fall uh not necessarily key because that just makes your items magical you can throw that in as well that's it that's an easy one it shouldn't even be an ability you should just get it automatically for free um stillness of mind purity of body diamond soul timeless body empty body um perfect self um now perfect self i mean 3 3.5 the uh the monk in 3.5 had so many more completely what's the word worthless completely worthless abilities uh at least i don't know whether or not they did that for pathfinder but i do know that the old 3.5 one especially going to second edition the the monk was um it had a lot of weird abilities At purity of body let's see purity of body here um yeah, so purity of body is still the same. You're immune to disease. But diamond soul, what was the... Yeah, the perfect self is a much more weird and weirdly magical. Perfect self in the 3.5, you just get more key points. It's, it's not nearly as, as powerful ability as a key as the perfect self. You become magical. You're treated as an outsider. <laughs> you don't age. It's a, it's a bizarre thing. There's, there are some combat abilities. Um, you get damage reduction 10 chaotic, um, which is so friggin' specific that it barely ever pops up. Uh, but most of the abilities there. Slow fall doesn't change. Yeah, timeless body, you no longer age. And timeless body here, yeah, they're basically the same thing. You don't age. So stuff like that goes into the, the wushu. It goes into those monk abilities. Um, so we'll put that into the Wushu subclass of the martial artist, but it won't be part and parcel of this martial artist class. Um, yeah. I hope martial artist or monk starts with a D6 or D8 damage die. Like, what do they start off with? Oh, they start off with one die four. Yeah, that sucks. Oh yeah, that sucks completely. That's horrible. Give me an idea how long it's been since I played. I never play a monk. I never play. I play a fighter or play a rogue. I never play a monk. I think it's because I always think it's so very, very artifically, um, you know, Asian martial artist style. It always feels out of place in, in the campaign. So when we go to martial artist, now if you don't know martial artist, here's I'm here. I'm so learning again. In the martial artist class, there was something that was very unique. Um, heavy, martial, martial artist. Martial artist, they had damage die. Aha, uh -huh, see? So I am not... A martial artist, the damage starts at 1 die 6. So right off the bat, it's a bit different. That being said, uh, you don't get as many first attacks. The other thing that we did was we did the finishing moves and the combo chain. So that was the big thing with martial artist. Uh, it had a combo chain. The combo chain is the more times you attacked successfully, you hit successfully, your damage die would go up. So it would go from 1 day 6 to 1 day 8 to 1 day 10 to 1 day 12 and 2 day 6. And you had access to the higher tiers as you went up. So um, on first level, you can go to tier 3. You get access to tier 4 at 9th level and tier 5 at 13th level. So if you attack three times in a row, sorry, if you hit three times in a row without missing, then by your third attack, your damage had gone up to 1 die 10, right? And it stays at 1 die 10 until you miss. And when you miss, it goes back down to 1 die 6. Uh, but if you decide to do a finishing move, you activate a finishing move that you have access to. And at 1 die 10, you had access to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I think 8 different types of finishing moves. But when you did a finishing move, you went back to 1 die 6. So you had to start the chain up again. Uh, 
So the martial artist was much more a kinetic force. He, he was much more of a, of a striker compared to the monk, which was this balance of, of multiple small attacks and so forth. Uh, I don't think going back to... Oops, that's the wrong book. Going back to 5e here. So they have um, martial arts. You can use dex. D4 plays normal damage. Yeah, so you get two attacks because you get to use your your bonus action as an additional attack. And let's see here. Um, you can use spend these key points to fuel various key features. You start knowing three such features: flurry of bows, patient defense, step of the wind. Um, yeah, there it is. Yeah. So, um, and we don't have any of that. So we we just have uh, the 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 combo chain. And then you have some abilities, and then we have a whole bunch of what is called martial exploits. And martial exploits allow you to play with stuff like uh, pound for pound. Martial exploits allow you to play with your idea, and you can move into wrestling, ground pounding, and so forth. You could be more of a boxer, um, wrestler, vicious hook, and so forth. And then, of course, with the subclass, you could then, if you want, go into brawler, wrestler, or into grandmaster, where you got into the wushu abilities. So that was how we did it, and that's probably how we're going to move. Like when we design these classes, I'm probably just going to move martial artist over and expand the grandmaster, uh, or add another. Uh, probably not even do grandmaster because I may keep grandmaster because grandmaster is much more of a, 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 a physical martial art ability, and instead use create a new subclass that was the magical monk, and I'm probably not going to call him a magical monk. I'll probably call it like a wushu or something. Uh, and that's where all the magical monk stuff would would fall into. Um, so yeah, so so that's one thing. Arm strike, finesse, and like I'll stay one one night, uh, and I just gotta remind myself um, when we get to classes that I won't be using monk. There'll be no monk. There'll be a martial artist. Um, so I'm gonna end it there, uh, just because we're gonna start next time. I, I do want to get this section finished. Uh, we're gonna be working with oh, no race. Species, species, species. Uh, some people have actually talked about removing species outright, and no, we're gonna. If you have aliens and, and elves, you're gonna have species. We're, we're definitely gonna have species. We're gonna go through the standard cliches, and we're not gonna probably put in tieflings or dragonborn. Uh, we're gonna go through it. Maybe we'll have a couple variations of elves pulled from amethyst or something like that. Uh, but I'm not gonna put a tiefling. But we'll probably have some fun. Throw in an alien or two, and maybe throw in the automaton uh, for, for shits and giggles. Um, I won't do any descriptive text. We're just going to do the traits. Um, so it'll be species all, uh, next time. The other thing is, would this be better doing this on a weekend? Uh, this is the other question I want to ask people, whether or not you guys want to do on weekends, whether or not a weekend at a specific time is better for you. Um, it doesn't matter to me either way, but a weekend, maybe on a Saturday at 11, more people could attend because I imagine a lot of people, especially in North America, are probably at work. So and if, if, if a weekend is a better uh, a better time, do a stream. Maybe we'll do one uh, not this Saturday, but following, following Saturday. But anyway, guys, this has been Chris with Jason Smackana. I'll get all this updated when I have a chance, and I will see you guys all on the flip side. Take care.